Today's lecture is on hunger, and as you know, I've shown uh, in most classes some comedy clip, something amusing toward the end of the class or at the end of the class. I'm not choosing to do that for this particular topic because it's a very serious, in some cases sad topic, when one starts to look at the world distribution of hunger, how many people are affected and what it does to people's lives. Um, and let's show you how that might be. I'd like to begin with two stories from World War II that have to do with the issue of hunger. One an experiment and one a very real and compelling human story. The first, the experiment I'm going to like to talk to you about is called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. Uh, this was a study that was conducted at the University of Minnesota by a head headed by a researcher named Ansel Keys, whose name you've heard before. I'll talk more about him in a minute. The purpose was to understand what affects starvation and then subsequent refeeding when people had access to food and what effects that had both psychologically and more important physically on people. Um, at that time, the issue was very important. Of course, world hunger has been an issue and was an issue before that. So there was interest from a scientific and, and humanitarian point of view at that point. But during World War II, because of um, whole populations being cut off from food, there was a very real concern with ex excessive numbers of people uh, being added to the world uh, distribution of hunger. And the, the Americans wanted to find out, the government and the scientists wanted, wanted to find out what effects does this have on people, how enduring are the effects, and then how could we best uh, repair the problem once the, the, the populations got freed when the war was over and there was food entering their systems again. <coughs> the project, as I mentioned, was led by the researcher Ansel Keys, and you'll remember his name uh, for having done the Seven Countries study. He was also known at the time for inventing the K-ration, that was the Army's unit of feeding for people, and um, was a very prominent, well-known researcher, and did this remarkable study with a relatively small number of people, but he collected an enormous amount of data from it, and wrote, the, wrote a very impressive volume called The Biology of Human Starvation that was really the classic in the field, in fact, still is, um, for, for many years, two volume set, very impressive piece of work. What this particular study involved was 36 uh, conscientious objectors who at the time refused to take part in military service but were required as a consequence by the government to do something uh, to, to contribute to the country's well-being. And so some of them were given the option of taking part in this experiment to uh, satisfy that duty. The um, project took place from November 44 to December of 1945. It began with a 12, and so these subjects were at the University of Minnesota for that entire time under pretty carefully controlled circumstances. They had a 12-week baseline phase where they were fed normal amounts of food, and a lot of information was collected on biological and psychological issues or uh, factors for them and so that became the base rate that was then then later com the uh, starvation period was compared to then a 24 week phase where individuals were cut down on their calorie levels significantly so the average person lost about 25 percent of their body weight then subsequently there was a refeeding phase and during that phase different groups of people were fed different sorts of diets to see what would be the best way to replenish the body and repair whatever damage was done by the calorie deficiency. Um, there's a, a very interesting book, and I'll show you the cover of it in just a minute, um, written in 2006, published by the University of Minnesota Press by Tucker called The Great Starvation Experiment. And it talks about the history of Ansel Keys, but also about the experiences of the men who were in this particular study. <clears throat> and he had some photographs, and here's a photograph of one of the subjects before and after the starvation phase. Here's an example of another subject in the study who went from 145 to 117 pounds during the starvation phase. And some of the other interesting photos in the book um, are the testing that was done on cognitive and dexterity issues, but as well as a lot of uh, biological measures and then there were these anecdotes, for example, of the low body temperature 
that, that, that gets created by starvation where people just can't feel warm. And so these men were laying out in the sun trying to um, get as warm as they could. This study uh, found a number of profound effects, both psychological and biological. Um, on the psychological side, the, the not surprising but profound result of this was how much these men were preoccupied with food. They dreamed about food, they thought about food, what, with what food they had ate, they took enormous care, all of these things you would expect for a person being starved. But there were a number of other experiences that these, these men went through and Keyes and his colleagues documented. Depression in these individuals, severe emotional distress, the behavioral effects, are some of which I just mentioned, dealt not only with food but with social interactions, leading to social isolation. You might expect lack of sexual interest in these, these folks. And there were even some cases, um, one man in particular chopped off several of his fingers with an ax. And the, 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 he hardly remembered doing it afterwards, which was an interesting part of the story. And the investigators, the scientists, never really knew whether he did this as a desire to get out of the study, to have an excuse for getting out of the study, uh, or whether there was some more serious cycle, well, not that that's not serious, but some uh, ad additional psychological disturbance that he might have been experiencing. There were also poor cognitive effects. Now, not too many of these showed up on objective tests, but the men perceived things like concentration and memory deteriorating. And a series of biological effects, the cold intolerance I mentioned, the slow metabolism, which makes sense, I'll describe in a minute, the low body temperature, respiration, heart rate, and even things like edema because the men were drinking so much water just in an attempt to feel full. And so these are very serious effects. Um, why would metabolic rate go down? Okay, yes. Okay, exactly right. The body is trying to protect its energy stores. If you're starving and you need to protect every ounce of store energy you have, you don't want to be throwing a lot of heat off and, and wasting energy through the metabolic process. And so if, if all of you went on a diet today, a pretty serious diet, something like this, your metabolic rate would go down very quickly, even before we started to notice big changes in your body weight. And that happens as a defense against what the body perceives as starvation. Now, when people go on diets, the body doesn't recognize that, well, okay, I'm trying Atkins because I want to lose five pounds. All it knows is that your body is not getting its usual number of calories, and that signals a protective defense, and that's what this is really all about. So as I said, this book called The Great Starvation Experiment is very interesting, and it it tells stories about this study and about the characters in it and the scientists and how they interacted with the subjects and the like. So a lot of what we know <coughs> about the science of human starvation with data collected by Keyes and his colleagues with only 36 subjects but done very carefully back in the 1940s. <coughs> the next example from World War II that I'd like to discuss has to do with the siege of Leningrad. Um, that happened in September 41 to January 1943. And this book that I just mentioned by Tucker speaks about the Leningrad experience. In fact, the book leads off with it. And I'd like to read you some text from the Tucker book that deals with this particular experience. As in most modern sieges, the zoo animals were among the first victims in Leningrad. It was not a hard decision. What was the point of watching the poor beasts starve when they could nourish famished people for a few days? The hungry Leningraders felt not a whit of sentimentality as they slaughtered the animals, filling the cold streets with the steaming blood of tigers, lions, and giraffes. The, Jews, the, the zoo's livestock quickly disappeared as the people of Leningrad first acquired their taste for exotic meats. It was no November 1941. The people of Leningrad were beginning the hungry winter, the coldest winter ever in a city with a proud history of miserably cold winters. Hitler's army had surrounded them since September 8, 1941. 
the Fuhrer needed to move the tanks and artillery that surrounded the city to other fronts, but the stubborn people of Leningrad wouldn't cooperate by surrendering. Hitler also didn't want to be burdened with the feeding of millions of famished people when the city finally capitulated. Hitler formulated an elegant plan, one that would both free up his artillery and reduce the eventual number of captives in his clutches. Hitler ordered that Leningrad be starved into submission. The siege would last 872 days. After the zoo animals, the people of Leningrad next turned to their household pets. Killing beloved dogs and cats was slightly harder than killing zoo animals, but an easy decision nonetheless for hungry enough people. The people had no choice but to supplement their official ration. The government gave manual workers an allotment of bread and cabbage that amounted to 700 calories a day, about a fifth of an adult's daily energy requirement. Non-manual workers were given only 473 calories a day, children 423. Dogs and cats disappeared, even the rats fled as their food supplies disappeared in the city. Hungry people of the city took some comfort in the knowledge that their rats now populated the relatively well-provisioned trenches of their German tormentors. As the siege dragged on, temperatures plummeted to minus 40 degrees. The people collectively remembered that some wallpaper paste was made from potatoes. Wallpaper was stripped away from the living rooms and parlors of Leningrad. The paste scraped into pots and boiled into soup a soup that tasted much more like paste than potatoes. Leather, too, could be boiled into a gelatinous mess that could briefly satisfy the sharpest pangs of hunger. By 1943, the siege entered its second year. All the animals, wallpaper, paste, and leather had been consumed. The people descended into a rare kind of hunger, a hunger that tested even the most fundamental taboos. People began eating corpses. In, the cases, in, in most cases, the flesh was still firm and well-preserved by the frigid temperatures. The eating of the dead became a ghoulish fact of life until inevitably the hungriest began looking for fresher meat. The children of Leningrad began disappearing. As rumors of cannibalism spread, it became illegal to sell any form of ground meat in the city as the sources became too horrifically questionable. In one case, the bones of several dozen children were found inside the apartment of a concert violinist. Even his own five-year-old son was missing. The Leningrad police formed a special division to combat cannibalism. By the beginning of 1944, as even corpses and children became scarce, there were reports of people cutting off their own body parts and eating them in a desperate attempt to stave off hunger. The Red Army broke through the German lines on January 27, 1944, and the siege was lifted. In all, a million Soviets had starved to death in that city, more than a thousand per day. People were forbidden, both officially and unofficially, from ever speaking of the cannibalism that took place during the siege. The Soviets had learned to a frightening extent how much the availability of food allows civilization to occur. Now that's a very startling example of what can happen when people are under desperate circumstances with hunger. Now that sort of thing doesn't happen very often, but it's certainly possible as conditions become dire enough. And I have the text into these slides if you'd like to refer back to it later. The situation with world hunger is becoming even more severe than it has been in the past. Uh, this report just came out a few days ago and uh, released by Care International and they talked about the number of people in the world who are living in a state of emergency. That is, the poverty is, is severe, uh, problems with hunger and food are severe as well. And they talked about how the number of people who are right on this edge of emergency, uh, right on the edge of dire crisis, had doubled in only two years. Uh, 220 million people, they said, were now affected by this. And too often, they said, the aid that world, government, world governments give is late, short-term, and it doesn't focus on helping cultures survive in the long term, but basically just throws food at them, and it may help solve the problem in the short term, but of course doesn't help in the long term. 
So this report was very critical of the lack of attention to this by the world and also the way aid tends to be given. And we'll come back to the aid later on. Uh, the issue of hunger has been around for many years, and you can see these really discouraging pictures from the cover of Time magazine starting in 79. And then more recently you see things like this. So you have to ask the question, why can't the world deal with this problem? You know, most people know it's a problem. Uh, you see things on television, celebrities are out there trying to help with the hunger problem. You have big foundations that want to do something about it. Lots of money goes toward it in some cases. Why can't we solve this problem? Is there not enough food in the world? Well, no, that's not right. There is enough food in the world. This is a political problem, one that the world could solve. There's plenty of money in the world, plenty of food in the world. There won't always be, as I'll describe in a later class, but at least at the moment there's enough food in the world, but we're not solving this problem. And we have to ask ourselves why, and are there any solutions to this perplexing, difficult, and tormenting human problem? So here's a statistic that uh, deals with how many people die of hunger every 3.6 seconds. 75% of the victims are children. And so 16,000 people worldwide, children, die every day of hunger and its related consequences. I mean, that's as many as live in, you know, some towns in, in many countries, more than live in some towns in many countries. And that's how many people are, and children are dying every day. The United Nations and, and other world agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization pay attention to this issue of hunger. And here are a few things that have come from the UN. They define hunger in malnutrition, saying that it's over a prolonged period of time, the victims live on a significantly lower percentage of food than they need to sustain a healthy life. And then they talk about the consequences. The body compensates by slowing down its physical and mental activities, including metabolic rate. A hungry mind cannot concentrate. A hungry body does not take initiative. A hungry child loses all desire to play and study. Hunger also weakens the immune system, and this is where a lot of the deaths occur. Deprived of the right nutrition, hungry children are especially vulnerable and become too weak to fight off disease and may die from common infections like measles and diarrhea. It's amazing how many children around the world die of something that we consider an unpleasant but temporary condition like diarrhea. Um, and then they talk about some of the, the numbers. In the United States, we uh, used to use the word hunger to talk about this condition, but now people talk about food insecurity. And to some extent, it's... Um, it's a helpful change in definition because it, it captures more about the phenomenon than just the word hunger uh, because it helps capture the social and personal circumstances that people live in rather than just the condition. But it's also a euphemism in some ways. It, it provides an intellectual academic term almost to describe what otherwise people might consider a very human thing, the concept of hunger. But here's how it's defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's defined as access by all household members at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Food insecurity, food insecurity household is not severe. Now, what, what does that mean? Uh, I've got to go figure that one out. Okay, so measured officially by a scale that has 18 items. Uh, here are examples of those to give you a sense of how the concept of food insecurity is defined. So if people are worried that food runs out before they have enough money to buy more, that's insecure relationship with food. Adults cut the size of meals or skip meals uh, because they don't have enough food. People are hungry but don't eat because they can't afford it. They rely on a few kinds of low-cost food to feed children especially. Now we'll come back to this later in the class when we talk about economics and how the cost of food and the relative cost in our culture of healthier and unhealthier options drive people towards certain parts of the food supply and what that means for diets of the poor. And then the final example of this 18-item scale is children not eating for an entire day. 
So you can imagine what it feels like. Some of you may have done this for religious reasons, to go a whole day without eating and how that feels. And imagine that happening on a repeated basis and an unpredictable basis where you just don't know when it's going to happen and what that would do. In the U.S., food insecurity is a big problem. Uh, government statistics suggest that one out of nine households, one out of nine, experience hunger or they're at risk for experiencing this. The risk is very high in some groups. So if the base rate is one in nine, you get more than twice that, about twice that uh, rate in Hispanic households and a little bit more in African American households. And then some subgroups of the population in households with single women with children, the rates are as high as 30%. So these are pretty alarming statistics and most people don't think too much about America being a problem where hunger exists because the more concern that people have shown, at least in the press in recent years, is with overnutrition and that certainly is an issue, but hunger is as well and it's not really gone away. And then some of these issues come up, especially with children who don't have enough nourishment to thrive. Now this graph, you can look at this at your leisure, um, but it shows a number of different groups and the rates of food insecurity in those particular groups. So you can see the breakdown by part of the country, by where people live, their income, um, their race, gender, etc. So those are all the statistics if you care to look at them. Um, th th it, gets, it gets manifested too and how many people are applying for government assistance uh, over the years to help remedy the food insecurity they experience. And so this graph shows from 2000 to 2007 the number of people who are food staff reci recipients. And you see the number going up and up and up. Now the numbers aren't available yet for 2008, but you might imagine that those numbers would be higher yet, not only because of the increasing trend, but because of the very high food prices that are existing now, the bad state of the economy, and other things that might people lead people to believe to be more insecure about food. <coughs> so let's put the world numbers in some context. I'd like to show you the population of some countries, not respect to hunger, just the raw population of countries. So if you take these particular countries, these are the populations. <coughs> let's then add in the populations of these countries. So you see, you know, major countries, including the U.S., in this population calculation. And this all adds up to 840, 804 million people. The line that you're going to see next shows the number of people in the world who are hungry. Eight hundred and sixty-two million. So more people than the populations of all those countries added together really quite a remarkable number. Now the reason I put this slide together is that when you see numbers like 862 million, they, it, they sound big and that is a pretty alarming figure. But when you think about it in the context of all these countries added together, and that's how many people in the world who are hungry but don't need to be. The world distribution of hunger probably won't surprise you very much, but it looks like this. If you show a graph of the, the world, the, in this case, the darker colors, especially the, the dark red color, designates higher levels of hunger and greater than 35 percent. And so you see the countries in South America in that band of the world, right through the middle there, especially in Africa, you've got lots of problems with hunger. And you can make some guesses about why this might be the case, with poverty being at the, the lead of the list. But there are other issues that come into play as well that help drive this, this, uh, this relationship. Now, besides poverty, and we know that exists in some parts of the world, what are some other reasons you think might be uh, driving hunger problems in those particular countries? What do you think? Yes. Pardon me? Water? Oh, war, okay. War definitely is an issue. We'll come back to that. Uh, yes. Climate is certainly another issue because there are some areas that are fertile, grow more crops than others. Yes? Okay, something like AIDS could be creating a problem because if the health care systems of already poor countries are being burdened by things like AIDS, which they certainly are, 
then the amount of money left over to feed hungry people goes way down. Yes? Technology. Okay. How would technology be uh, a player? Like Okay, so technology could be a barrier. So in the poor countries that don't have the advanced technologies, there could be uh, limitations in how much food gets grown, say with farm and, and agriculture technology, and then produced as well. So that's a good point. Yes? Okay, trade policies from the wealthier countries adversely affecting the poorer countries could be a real player. We will talk about that in class. Yes? Corruption. Okay, corruption. How would corruption be a factor? Right, exactly. And so corruption really is a player here in several ways. One that you mentioned, which is if a corrupt government is hoarding the money for the wealthy people who are running it, then the money doesn't get out to the people for basic needs like food. The other place where corruption plays a big player in the way aid gets used when it enters a country to try to correct these kind of a problem, the problem is and where it goes and who gets it and whether the money is really being used for the intended purpose varies a lot from country to country, and that's a big issue. Other ideas about what might be driving this relationship? And you guys have really got, got the, the highlights here. And, and it's interesting how many factors converge to be driving this, this sort of thing. Um, if we look at a country like India, we find some interesting things. Now, here's a map of India showing by color where hunger resides in greatest numbers. And so the darker colors, the, the orange color that you see there, cluster designates greater than 50% of children being hungry uh, and malnourished. Now, it's interesting. We'll, you, we'll come back to India as an example, and I have an NPR clip I'll play for you in a later class that talks about India as an example where hunger and overnutrition coexist. And you find cases in a country like India, as you do in the United States, where in the same district you have both conditions, in the same uh, neighborhood you have both conditions, and in some cases in the same family you have both conditions. So undernutrition and overnutrition become a world problem, and it shows how bad the relationship with food is psychologically but also politically. And if there are a way to correct this, and resolve the overnutrition and to resolve the undernutrition, sort of bring everybody up to a happy medium, you can imagine how much better off the world would be. Countries that are hardest hit, you could guess from the map that I just showed you, but this shows the particular breakdown about what parts of the world the countries are in that, that have the greatest problems with hunger. Uh, the greatest number in sub-Saharan Africa, as the previous slide suggested. Malnutrition, let's talk about that. There are several um, ways malnutrition can affect the body. And one way is through deficiencies in macronutrients. So that means you just don't get enough of protein, carbohydrate, or fat. Remember, those are the three macronutrients. And then collectively, they provide calories to survive. So your engine just doesn't have enough energy to keep going. Your gas tank is empty. You're just not able to function. And then these particular nutrients carry with them a series of particular biological problems when people suffer from deficiencies. And then, as you might guess, the other problem is with micronutrients, and both of them create issues, very serious issues. Uh, this is a slide that I showed you before, but we'll pause a little bit longer over at this time, which shows some of the biological consequences of hunger and starvation. And as you can see, basically every system in the body is affected. And none of these things would surprise you, but you can imagine how weak a body would become and how um, it would lack resistance, therefore, to typical uh, health insults or diseases when all of these systems are affected. So hunger affects every part of the body. And you can imagine as these things are happening, that the, 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 each of these systems, each of these parts of the body, is sending out signals to eat, feed me, get me some food, defend me from starvation, 
and how powerful an effect that would have on an individual. And the, the anecdote about Leningrad gives you some sense of that. There are several visible manifestations of hunger, not only wasting away and having people who are extraordinarily um, thin and malnourished, but there are several things that you s tend to see a lot in pictures. And so I'd like to describe what these two conditions are. The first is called marasmus. This, has to, this is a wasting disease where you get the kind of pictures that you see on that child on the right, which is a severely malnourished individual that comes from a protein energy malnutrition. So a particular concern in the macronutrient profile, the protein, carbohydrates, and fat, is the protein. And when that becomes deficient in a diet, this condition tends to kick in. And the protein energy malnutrition would mean low calories and low protein. The impact of this um, is uh, de deficiencies in, in, uh, uh, in all parts of the macronutrient diet, and there are signs of it that you tend to see in these pictures. Uh, low weight gain and wasting and being very, very thin is called stunting in most parts of the world. That's the term that you see used most by the World Health Organization. In the United States, we call it different. Uh, so there are different terms for it, but it all adds up to the same thing. The other uh, issue that you see uh, depicted in pictures a lot is called kwashiorkor. Uh, this is caused by inadequate protein intake while there are sufficient calories. So there's not exactly the same wasting that you see in the other diseases. Uh, and it comes from habitual consumption when people's foods are restricted in variety and people continually consume things that are dominant in carbohydrate, low in protein, and the slide gives you several examples of this. Uh, it leads to stomach bloating due, in, due to fluid retention and fat accumulation in the liver, and then you get the picture that you see like this. And so the, the individual on the right <coughs> is, is m malnourished in a much different way than the previous slide that, was, that, you, that depicted the child with marasmus. Both malnourished, but differentially malnourished with access to different nutrients or restricted access to different nutrients. And so you see these pictures a lot uh, when hunger is depicted. So desperately unhealthy children in these cases um, where the calories are probably sufficient to maintain normal health, but particular nutrients are not. Here are some additional facts about malnutrition. 50%, 56% of all childhood deaths are affected by nutrition. Um, the primary mechanism here is that it potentiates the impact of infectious diseases. It makes individuals more vulnerable to infectious diseases and then more likely to pass them on because they're vulnerable and they keep them for a longer period of time. And here they talk about mild and moderate malnutrition, ones where people may not die, but they're affected. Their energy is affected, their ability to function is affected, and therefore their society is affected. These being big political problems and affecting the health and well-being of countries a lot. There are geopolitical issues that we talked about, and you guys nailed most of these when I asked you the question before. Part is the simple vagaries of where people happen to live. And so droughts happen more in some parts of the world, famine in more parts of the world, just as a consequence of the climate that people are exposed to. Poverty, of course, is an obvious driver, and I'll show you a slide in a moment that shows the world distribution of poverty. War becomes a big problem, and refugee populations, which are growing in size around the world, of course, have very little political power, very, very little government attention, few people watching out after them, and hunger becomes a big problem there. And then, as you guys also alluded to, and I was proud of you to hear you bring this up, the geopolitics of things, things like trade policies and subsidies affect the world food systems in ways that we'll describe later in class that affect things like both overnutrition and undernutrition in different parts of the world. Poverty, of course, is a major driver here, uh, not surprising there. Here's the geographic distribution of poverty. And in this case, the lighter colors depict greater levels of poverty. And you can see that band that we were focused on before 
that goes through South America, but mainly focuses on those countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, highly affected by poverty. And of course, hunger follows from that. So the question is, why here? What's going on in this part of the world? And some people have speculated about this. And part of it has to do with climate zones in certain parts of the world and the relative wealth that varies across the world. So <coughs> Jeffrey Sachs, and I'll show you uh, his picture in just a few moments, who's uh, um, a, a real leader in the whole area of world poverty and hunger and uh, diseases of this type worldwide, who's at Columbia University, uh, broke this down in an article he wrote at one point. So temperate parts of the world, and that would include areas like the United States, occupy 40% of the world's land area but have 67% of the world's wealth. So the land area is more or less consistent with the amount of the world's population, but the wealth is much higher. You take areas like the highland and the desert parts of the world, um, you have much less of the land area um, for the highland group. So that's only 7% of the world's population. So we won't factor that in so much. The desert areas have only 18% of the world's population. So we won't talk about that so much for the moment. But let's focus on tropical areas. And those would be the areas banded by those lines that you saw in the previous slide. Only 20% of the world's land area, <coughs> but 40% of the population, but only 17% of the world's wealth. So if we compare the temperate and tropical areas, we look here, we see that the temperate areas have twice as much land. They have about the same population, but look at this. I mean, what a startling difference. And so it's not surprising that you see hunger and poverty together in clustered in certain parts of the world. And the climate does tell part of the story. Sachs also talked about linking how the tropical zones are linked with poverty and why this might be. Well, one becomes poor access to the sea. And this goes way back in human history where moving goods becomes more expensive. So if you're a poor country, but you're landlocked and you're far from the sea where a lot of things get shipped, it's just going to be more expensive to get things to you, including food. So that becomes an issue. The climate is, is bad for growing food, but good for fostering disease, certain diseases in particular. So the climate becomes a good host, a good environment. It becomes rich in opportunity for disease-bearing organisms to thrive, but a hard place for food to grow and that becomes a problem. And so the worst category is the tropical area far from the sea. They talk about how the major grains that really help support a lot of the world's food supply don't grow very well in those kind of uh, environments. And that the, the, um, the yield from corn, for example, or maize, is triple in the temperate zones compared to the, the, the tropical zone. And the high mortality rate has women bearing a lot of children, which then creates a strain on the health care system, and that further weakens the ability of countries to feed its people. So those are problems. So these numbers are really quite remarkable. Billion point two people surviving on less than a dollar a day, 2.7 billion more on less than two dollars a day. <coughs> And the, this, that area between uh, less than a dollar and less than two dollars a day has changed over time, as you see from this particular bullet point. And so one billion, more than half, almost half of the world's children live in poverty. One of you mentioned war and refugees. This is a major issue. And so the, re the UN defines refugees as person li people living outside their country, al although there are plenty of people who are refugees but still remaining in the country's borders, unable to return owing to well-founded fear of persecution because of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership of a particular social group, and the number of refugees is considerable. Here's, uh, the most, here's a breakdown from the United Nations. Um, showing the 10 largest groups of people and their origin who are refugees. 
uh, starting with Afghanistan, and then the slide shows the countries of asylum where people have gone to. And usually when people are refugees, they're, they're not always, but in many cases, fleeing from one poor country to another. And it just shifts the political demands on countries, and countries unable to deal with hunger very much to begin with uh, can scarcely do it when they get an influx of refugees from another country. So war and refugees are, are an issue. Okay, so so far we painted this picture, I hope at least, of the magnitude of the problem. The number of people in the world who are hungry adds up to all those populations combined of uh, so many countries. Almost half the children in the world malnourished or hungry. Serious biological consequences, serious political consequences. So you see people suffering, people dying. The human cost of hunger is absolutely enormous. And the question is, can anything be done about this? What in the heck can we do about this problem that is such a plague on the world that just goes on and on and on? I mean, when I was a child, we were told to clean our plate because there were starving children in China, is what they said at the moment. Um, and so the, e even as far back as my boyhood, there was public concern about hunger. Our parents had talked about it at least. Not that they did much about it, but they at least talked about it. And so the concern has gone on for years and years and years. And yet the problem seems to be getting worse rather than better. Why doesn't the world have the will to solve this problem? Is the technology available? Yes. Is the money available? Some people have estimated that with as little as $3 billion, you could solve the world's hunger problem. $3 million, $3 billion gets used up in the Iraq war in 60 days or something. So you can imagine how easy it would be for the world, even the United States, just by itself, to solve the world's hunger problem if the political <coughs> will and if the political environment were good enough to support that desire. Well, one shining star in this pretty bleak, bleak picture overall is a project coordinated by the United Nations called the Millennium Development Project. This has had some very um, impressive successes, but it's too small, it's not funded enough, and isn't affecting enough parts of the world. But let's talk about what it is and then what it has accomplished. The UN goal uh, for the Millennium Development Project is for each country of the world to donate 0.7% of their gross national income for aid and development projects around the world. 0.7% of the gross national income. That money would then be pooled and used in the ways that might affect the poverty and hunger problem. And a quote from this, the UN report on the Millennium Development Project says this, if every developed country set and followed through on a timetable to reach this goal by 2015, the world can make dramatic progress in the fight against poverty and start on a path to achieve the Millennium Development Goals and end extreme poverty by 2015. Now, 2015 isn't very far away, and can you imagine how wonderful an outcome that would be to make a real dent in the extreme poverty suffered by the world. And all it would take would be for countries to pony up money in this amount. Specifically, the Millennium Development Goals have a series of, uh, there are a series of goals, but here's goal number one that pertains to the topic we're talking about today, which is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. And um, the UN, instead of just settling for a broad goal like this, created more uh, precise targets. So to cut in half between 2015, the portion of people whose income is less than a dollar a day. Target two, to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all, including women and young people. And target three, to cut in half the proportion of people who suffer from hunger. It's a manageable goal financially, perhaps not politically. Here's a graph or a chart showing the development assistance by country. And remember the 0.7%, percent that was discussed in the development goals. If you look at certain parts of the world, Denmark, 
the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Luxembourg, those countries are over the 0.7 already. So they give more than 0.7% of the gross national product to support aid work around the world. The U.S., 0.22%. So far short of the desired goal. Now the impression is that the U.S. does more than its share, that we're doing a really good job with aid around the world, and maybe we are. It really depends on your perspective. But just thinking about the numbers, part of it will depend on the denominator. So uh, because we have such a massive gross, nas gross national product and so much available wealth in this country, a small percentage of that, 0.22%, adds up to a lot of money. So there's the appearance that we're doing more than our share, the lion's share of aid around the world. And in terms of absolute dollars, that's probably true. But as a, fun as a fraction of our gross national product, we're not doing nearly what some other countries are. Now, all of you will have different opinions about what we should be doing in this domain. Not everybody feels like we should be running around the world and helping with these aid-related projects. And maybe that's true. It depends on your political persuasion and how you feel about this issue here. And so we can remain agnostic about whether we should be doing it. But the numbers are pretty clear about, uh, about whether we are doing it. Yes? What do the asterisks mean? I don't remember. <laughs> I'll ha yeah, I took this table from another source, and I'd have to go back and find out. So I'll try to do that, but I, I don't know what they refer to at the moment. Okay. Um, this Millennium Development Project by the UN has a, a subset called the Millennium Villages Project which is a pilot um, series of projects in 12 villages in Africa, um, picked because of them being hunger hotspots. And they have served as models for how the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, can be met within five years through community-led development. So the model here is that instead of just going in and dropping things into a community, like bags of food, for example, you go in and provide those resources but also work with community leaders in changing the way the community functions, providing more resources for people to build in capability so they can feed themselves, help solve the poverty problems. And there have been some interesting successes here, um, although these, the, these projects are relatively new, but they have um, worked quite in an interesting way. So a uh, particular town, Sori, in Kenya, and you see where it's located in the map, became worth one of the first Millennium Development villages. And the results from here have been very interesting. So begun, begun in July 2004 uh, because of agriculture technology um, being imported and, and uh, technology training done for the people, the production of maize has uh, more than tripled. So, of course, that really helps solve the hunger problem. Uh, there's a school feeding program that serves 17,000 students per day. And in this case, malaria, which was a terrible killer there, is down a great deal in prevalence. So simultaneously, the people doing this project were working on disease prevention, on remedying poverty, on agriculture sustainability, and on remediating hunger. And so this has been a real success. The question is, is there the funding and the political will to do it on a more broad scale? That really depends on world governments, on individual citizens within those governments, and how much attention they pay to this particular issue. I mentioned De Jeffrey Sachs before, who uh, is the director of a Columbia University Institute called the Earth Institute. And he's written extensively on this. Here's one of his books. And he lectures worldwide on this topic, meets with government officials around the world, and pushes hard to deal with these, these issues. <coughs> He's very interested in the impact of poverty and hunger on disease and other economic maladies that happen in various countries. So you have people like um, Jeffrey Sachs, who's an academic scholarly type person and, and activist, pushing hard on this. You have the UN pushing hard on it. And then, of, case you, of course, you get your share of celebrities who are involved in this particular issue as well. 
Uh, some give money and their time and visibility to it. Uh, you see several examples there. And then some, like Bill and Melinda Gates, through their foundation, give enormous amounts of money to try to help address these problems. So we hope, we hope that these efforts will lead to the right kind of aid, will lead to training in communities that foster sustainability and long-term remediation of poverty and hunger, and that this will help reduce the world's burden of the problem. So these kind of pictures are common, and, and some people, um, you know, take a jaded view when they see this sort of thing. You know, they, you know, people look at it and interpret it in different ways, and one could, I guess, question about whether overall this helps or hurts, but certainly these are people trying to do something about it, and to the extent that, that they're paying attention to it brings attention to the issue and gets world governments and individuals to may pay more attention than you would assume it was good. And they've had some uh, Gates and uh, the two celebrities here. This is Bill and Melinda Gates and Bono. You can see that they have achieved some notoriety because of this particular thing. So what are the world's main approaches to hunger? And what can be done? Well, first, attacking poverty has to become the cornerstone of this remediation process. Second is preventing diseases. And mo the diseases that you see here are communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and those things can be remediated if there's the will to do it. Um, we'll talk in a subsequent class coming right up on the Green Revolution and what that means. And the Green Revolution is a specific term that's relatively modern, relatively new in the, the landscape of food and agriculture, but it's had a big impact. Some say a negative impact, others say a positive impact, but there's no question it's had a big impact on the world's food approach to food. We'll talk more about that. Uh, change agriculture policy to help farmers. Um, more and more and more, people's indigenous food environments are being eroded and they're eating imported processed foods. And it's happening in country after country, even in, in places of the world where you wouldn't expect it so much. And this has serious implications. Part of it has to do with agriculture and subsidy policy in the U.S international trade policy that affects the ability of local farmers to survive and being able to feed themselves, their family, and make enough money to, to earn a living. We'll talk more about those policies. And of course, the most important thing of all is getting the world to care. And if people care about this, then the political will and the money might be forthcoming. <coughs> there are a number of key organizations in this picture, and I'd like to tell you what some of them are. Uh, first is the Food and Agriculture Organization um, and the World, World Health Organization. Both are units of the United Nations. And as you can tell from their names, the WHO, which resides in Geneva, cares about health and disease around the world. The Food and Agriculture uh, Organization cares about those issues. And more than ever before, these two organizations are talking to one another. <coughs> Excuse me. But then also, we have things like the IMF and the World Bank being important players because of international policy regarding money. The humanity of hunger is something I'd like to loop back to. And then I'd like to show you a few video clips to end. There was a terrific piece in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in, in, in 2003 by an um, award-winning author named Barry Barak about why people starve. Here's a picture of him uh, getting the Pulitzer Prize. <coughs> and he wrote a particular article about this country in Africa, Malawi. And the map of it is shown there. Here are some quotes from the article. Families often endure this hungry period on a single meal a day, sometimes nothing more than a forged handful of greens. Last year's food crisis was the worst in living memory. Hundreds and probably thousands of Malawians succumbed to the sky of hunger-related death. Even small jolts to the regular food supply 
can jar open the trap door between what is normal, what is chronic malnutrition, and what is exceptional, which is outright starvation. Hunger and disease then malignly feed off each other, leaving the invisible poor to die in invisible numbers. Very powerful language being used here. The word invisible, of course, being key to that. There is no way to get used to hunger, Adelisi told me once. All the time something is moving in your stomach, you feel the emptiness. You feel your intestines moving. They are too empty and they are searching for something to fill up on. Among those who perished were Adelisi's husband, Robert, and their grown daughter, Matadi Robert, herself the mother of four young sons. The two died within a month of each other, unable to subsist on the pumpkin leaves and wild vegetables that had become the family's only nourishment. It was strange the way Robert seemed to fade. Before the start of the hungry months, it had been he who had kept the family going, leaving before dawn each day to sell firewood or tend someone's fields. But then work became impossibly scarce, and Robert seemed to be using himself up in the search for it. At the peak of the crisis, there was nothing to do but beg, and you were begging from others who needed to beg. Robert grew too weak to work. He and Adelisi went to the government hospital where he was treated for malnutrition and later treated for malaria, then sent home. When they released him, the doctors said he needed to eat better or he would die. Inevitably, there was little food, so he began his capitulation, imparting final goodbyes. So you get a sense from the story of one family how poverty and disease and hunger affect themselves and how a country in dire straits won't have work for people, they then can't afford to buy food, and the cycle begins and ends in such a tragic way. And so Barak, in his uh, article in the Times Magazine, said, with survival so precarious, life is lived at the edge of nothingness, easily pushed over the edge. So this fragility, the insecurity, the, the instability creates quite an impact on societies and the people who live in them. Now I'd like, you to, I'd like to show you several videos that were produced regarding hunger uh, by an organization called the World Food Program that invited individuals, uh, amateurs for the most part, uh, to put together videos dealing with the hunger issue. And I'd like to show you three of them because I think they're really quite, quite interesting and good, each of them short. And I gave you the website so you can go and, and re-listen to these or uh, watch them again yourself. Okay, so here's one. Sorry, not sure why this one's not loading so well. Okay, let's do one of the others. what's wrong with the web here. Yeah, let's try this one. Maybe we'll have better luck. Well, this is turning out to be an unsatisfying experience, isn't it? Pardon me? Okay, let me try the last one ran, ran fine this morning. Let me try this one.
So let me try to show you the one. Let's try again to pull up one of the others, see if we can get it to load. Oh, here we go. Okay, we'll see you guys next class.